Poverty and shame will come to him who disdains correction. But he who regards a rebuke will be honoured. A desire accomplished is sweet to the soul, but it is an abomination to fools to depart from evil. My name's Arthur and I thank you for joining me as we meditate and share together from Proverbs chapter 13, verses 18 to 19. Poverty and shame will come to him who disdains correction, but he who regards a rebuke will be honoured. We all need correction because we all do things that are wrong. None of us are able to do things perfectly. We don't even know what to do. We need to be told what to do. And then, as we've learned what to do, we don't do it perfectly, so we need correction. But our stubborn heart does not like correction, because sometimes that correction is not flattering to us. Sometimes we have great trouble and we get very cross about the matter that We can't meet the expectation of others and we blame them rather than recognising the fault is in ourselves. But our proverb is saying we've always got to take a positive attitude to correction. When somebody corrects us, there is something that needs correcting. Now we can think about a simple thing as learning to write and forming the letters correctly, but the real issues of life are those about how you deal with people, how you respond to people and how you engage in business. And the proverb saying poverty and shame come to him who disdains correction. Just as there is a system in the creation at large, so there is a system in society and we need to work together with others and that means that we need to follow the same conventions, just as as simple a matter as driving on the correct side of the road. If you drive on the wrong side of the road, then people will immediately yell at you and glare at you, and you'll end up having an accident, so you won't be able to work, and so there will be poverty as well, missed opportunities. But in all areas, our relationships with other people depend on listening to them, taking heed to what they say and adapting our response to what we learn. And so the second part of this proverb is he who regards a rebuke will be honoured. The person who listens to what is said and responds to it, it's not always that the fault that is pointed out to us is the actual fault. We need to listen to what is said, but analyse it ourselves to see, is that the real issue, or is there some other issue? For example, a child who has dyslexia, who has trouble writing. You can seek to correct them as much as you like, but it's not their will to write the letters that's the problem. It's the fact that they can't see the letters in the first place. So the problem is not always the superficial one. But if there is a problem, he who regards a rebuke will be honoured. In other words, we seek to solve the problem and address the issue that is raised. And then we can cooperate with others, we can work with others as a team, the society goes ahead. Of course, where does correction come from? Where does rebuke come from? First of all, it comes from our parents and our teachers and our mentors, and our supervisors, and our colleagues. But ultimately, it comes from the Word of God. For the Scripture says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. It sets the standard. It tells us what is wrong, the rebuke, and tells us how to do it correctly, the correction. We need to take heed to the word of God in working out how we shall live. Verse 19 says, A desire accomplished is sweet to the soul, but it is an abomination to fools to depart from evil. Each of us 
has some goal in our life and we find satisfaction in achieving those goals. You look at Olympians, when they win the gold, their faces shine, even a silver or a bronze. But they should not be ashamed if they don't win, but nevertheless there is great sweetness in winning. A desire accomplished is sweet to the soul, a great satisfaction in achieving something that you've set out to achieve. But there is an opposite side of this. Not all desires are desirable. Some people seek evil things. So the proverb says it is an abomination to fools to depart from evil. Their desires are corrupted. What they desire is not good either for themselves or for society. So the scriptures separate people into two camps, the righteous and those who are not righteous, the fools. The righteous hunger and thirst for righteousness. And Jesus promises that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be satisfied. It's not that the righteous actually succeed in living a sinless life. That's not possible for anybody. But they desire, and so they turn away from evil and pursue righteousness. For those who seek righteousness will seek God, and those who seek God will be found by God and will be included in his eternal kingdom. I've been thinking recently of the fact that this world is destined for destruction. Not as soon as climate change proponents announce, because the scriptures indicate there's at least a thousand years of very great productivity in store for the earth. But nevertheless, when the earth has run its course, it will be burned up and destroyed. Everything grows old. And so anything that we achieve that belongs to this world will be burned up and destroyed. It will at any case cease to be relevant to us when we die. But the righteous seeks eternity and eternal life and hungers and thirsts for righteousness and they shall be satisfied because the righteous are appointed as citizens of heaven, God's eternal kingdom. And when we finish our course here, that's where we go. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord in paradise, in that eternal kingdom that the Father has prepared for those who love him. But there are those who do not love him, who do not hunger and thirst for righteousness, but hunger and thirst for the immediate satisfaction of material things and earthly things. They use whatever means they can, and that is ultimately the definition of an evil person, a person whose life is taken up with the material things of this world. That's what's valuable to them. Jesus said a man's life does not consist of the abundance of things he possesses. But for so many people, that's all that life is, about accumulating things. And those things that we accumulate will quickly be taken away. In his first epistle, John states it this way, Do not love the world or the things are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. And the psalmist puts it this way. In Psalm 15, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. And the last verse of Psalm 17. As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. So what is it that is our goal? To know God and to enjoy righteousness and holiness or to accumulate things, to be chasing after status, recognition, honours on earth. It's an abomination to fools to depart from evil. As for me, I shall be satisfied when I awake 
in your likeness.